So first off, thank you all for joining me today. Uh, my name is Charlie Onorati. I am the Education Program Coordinator for Save the Bay. Save the Bay is the oldest and largest nonprofit that works exclusively in the Bay Area to protect and restore and celebrate the San Francisco Bay. You came to hang out with me today to learn about my favorite biome, my favorite ecosystem, which is wetlands. Um, wetlands are our protectors and they are the first line of defense for us against sea level rise and flooding as a result of climate change. So today we're gonna to be exploring wetlands, why they're so important and why you should care and what you can do to help restore them. So we're gonna answer some questions today. The first question is, why should we care about the San Francisco Bay? Why is it important? And what happened to it that it needs to be saved? To answer this question, I'm going to show you some pictures and tell you a story. Um, the second question that we're gonna to answer together today is what roles do wetlands play specifically in meeting the challenge of climate change? What makes wetlands so unique and special? Why do I love them so much? Um, and why will you love them at the end of this? For this question, I'm gonna show a video and then I'll stop sharing my screen after the video and we can talk together so I can see your faces again and hopefully hear your voices. Um, and I'll ask you to raise your hands so I can unmute you so you can talk to everybody. Um, if you are just coming in, welcome. We're gonna answer, this is what we're gonna be doing today. If you're also, if you're coming in, please mute yourself. The third and final question that we are going to answer together today is what are we doing about wetlands? What does Save the Bay do to restore wetlands um, and how? We're gonna finish the day with a little challenge, a fun activity for you all so we can finish on a fun note together. Um, so without further ado, Keyboard's not working. Here is the bay from space. This is the San Francisco Bay taken by a satellite. And a lot of people say it looks like a mermaid. You can see the head would be here and the hair flows out to the east. And then of course the body and the tail. Um, personally, I see a seahorse with the head here and the snout going this way and the body and the seahorse tail down here. Um, let me know in the chat box what you see when you look at the bay from space. I really like to know what other people see when they look at this picture. So type it out in the chat box and I'll call it out. People have told me that they see a butterfly, a hummingbird, yes, I've heard that one too. Um, people say also a whale's tail which is also called a fluke. You can see where the tail would be here, like the tail of a whale. Hummingbird with its wings and its body and its long nose. Um, thank you, Tiffany, for your participation. Moving right along. The San Francisco Bay connects us and is important to us because we live in the Bay Area. Ooh, someone said jaguar, cool. I haven't heard that one before. Thank you for sharing that. So the Bay is important to us because we live here, um, but it also is important and connects almost half of the state of California through its watershed. So let's define what a watershed is. If you put your hands together like this into a cup, like you're gonna drink from the sink, you make a watershed in your hands. So you can imagine if rain fell onto your hands where the water would collect and so what a watershed is, is the area of land that drains into a specific body of water. In our case, the San Francisco Bay watershed, the land that drains into it contains 40% of the state of California. So in other words, 40% of the rain that falls in our state and the snow that melts in the mountains will end up here. So that's just one reason why the Bay is so important and um, connects not just us who live here, but the entire state. The bay is also an estuary. An estuary is where salt water and fresh water mix to create 
brackish water. If you want to remember this, what an estuary is, you could do a little dance where the river meets the sea is the estuary. Um, <laughs> one of my better dance moves. So the rivers that come in from the Northeast, the San Joaquin and the Sacramento River, they bring with them nutrient rich sediment. And that sediment mixes with the Pacific Ocean coming in and the sediment, the soil um, settles on the shoreline of the bay. And these are the perfect conditions to form wetlands. What's a wetland? It's in the name. It is wet land. So it's land that is either always covered by water or sometimes covered by water. And the wetlands that we see in the bay are marshes, specifically tidal marshes. So a tidal marsh is an area of land that when the tides rise, it is covered and flooded by water. And when the tides go down, it dries up. Historically, these wetlands used to, the tidal marshes used to extend um, from the shoreline into the hills and all over the bay. Uh, but that's different now. So if you look at these maps, I'm gonna ask you to type in the chat box in a second, but check out these maps. On the left side, you see a map of the bay and what it looked like over 200 years ago, right? So this is the bay and what it looked like in the past. On the right side, you have what the bay looks like more now, a modern view of the bay. And these maps look very different. I want you to type in the chat box what the differences are you see between these two maps. What's the difference between the left side, the older map, and the right side, the newer map? What are some differences that you see there? Someone said they see Highway 37, right? So 200 years ago, Highway 37 wasn't there. Um, thanks CJ. Tiffany mentioned the colors are different, right? Um, and someone also said the bay shrunk over time. That's a really good observation. Um, also much less land designated to marshes. Great, these are awesome observations. So one thing I wanted to point out that you all mentioned is the difference in color. If we look at the left side, we see a lot of this nice bright green color. And if we look at the legend, we see that that green color is tidal marsh. Now, like you pointed out on the right side, we don't see much of that color. So um, if you had to guess, and you could type it in the chat box once again, if you had to guess what percentage of tidal marsh we've lost between this left side and this right side, what would be your guess? What percentage of this green color, this tidal marsh, have we lost? Seventy-five percent, ninety percent, ninety, 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 eighty-five. Oh, I bet some of you have learned this before. Eighty-five? Question mark. Nice. So yeah, it's ninety percent, which is a lot. But why? What happened to all this tidal marsh? It's called bay fill. And someone mentioned that the South Bay looked a lot thinner and that's because they brought um, soil and other stuff to fill the bay to create more land to build stuff. So in the early 1960s, the primary use of the bay other than shipping was for disposal of sewage and garbage. On the afternoon breeze, if you were near the bay, you could smell the untreated sewage. Um, at night, you could see fires on the shoreline where people would come and bring their um, trash and set it on fire. And with an average depth of only 14 feet in the bay at the shoreline, it's relatively easy for people to come um, dump soil or garbage and then put land on top of that to build things like ports, factories, freeways, someone mentioned Highway 37, shopping malls, airports, tons of stuff. And so the result was uh, a bay that was rapidly disappearing. And this is what you noticed. This graphic here is um, a projection created by the Army Corps of Engineers in 1960s. Um, it was published in the Oakland Tribune. And this was the Army Corps of Engineers prediction of what the bay would look like today if bay fill in the 60s continued the way that it was going. So if you look at the bottom, you can see areas projected to be filled by the year 2020. So 
that this is what Army Corps of Engineers thought in the 60s the bay would look like right now if Bayfield didn't stop. And this is where our founders um, entered the story. So they saw this graphic, they saw what was happening at the bay, um, and our founders, Sylvia, Esther, and Kay, decided that they were going to do something about it. So they organized a, a grassroots campaign to protect, preserve, and restore the San Francisco Bay. And in particular, their goal was to stop Bay fill, trash, and pollution. And this is amazing because this is a time with no social media, no cell phones, no computers, no emails. This was before the nation had an environmental movement and started to realize that they were destroying the environment. There was no Facebook, no Instagram, no TikToks, right? These ladies could not um, create a TikTok to raise awareness about what was happening to the Bay. Um, they had to go door to door and ask for $1 donations and get people to understand that the Bay is a treasure and not a landfill. So why was the Bay filled? Like for what reasons? What do we build? It's different depending on where you are in the Bay Area. So you, there's a lot of places in the Bay Area that were built on tidal marsh and a lot that you may also know. So here's a picture of the San Francisco International Airport being built. Um, so they bring in uh, bay fill, which could be anything, trash or soil. Um, the downtown, in San, downtown San Francisco, the Embarcadero and Financial District are all built on what used to be Tidal Marsh. This is San Francisco International Airport, also built on Tidal Marsh. You could see why people would want to build here. It's nice and flat, right? But we're getting rid of Tidal Marsh to do that. Um, also, Foster City in the peninsula in the South Bay. Um, this is a city that's home to 32,000 people built on what used to be Tidal Marsh and it's below sea level. In the South Bay, if you fly into Oakland International Airport or SFO or San Jose Airport, you might see these really brightly colored patches of land. And these are salt ponds where commercial production of salt occurs. So what happens is developers will build a levee, which is basically a wall of land, and they block these sections of land from the tides. So there's no more water coming in and out. So what happens is the brackish water, right, that mix of fresh and salt water starts to evaporate in these sections of land. And what you get is more and more salty conditions. Someone asked, why are they different colors? So when they evaporate, they get super salty. And the only thing that can live in those salty conditions, that super salty water, is certain types of bacteria. And the bacteria are the, what cause those vibrant, um, pretty cool colors. Thank you for your question. Unfortunately, to build uh, salt ponds, you have to get rid of all the vegetation. Um, and the soil becomes compacted and what, you, what was a really nice, beautiful tidal marsh um, ends up looking like this, just kind of waste, wasteland, super flat, no vegetation. In the north, it's different, right? I mentioned the rivers that bring nutrient-rich sediment. Um, the San Joaquin and the Sacramento River pour in in the north of the bay, and that nutrient-rich sediment is really good for farming, for agriculture. So, they use the same strategy where they build levees and basically block off pieces of land from the tides going in and out. Um, and they use the nutrient rich sediment coming in to grow crops. Um, and also these areas were used as grazing land for cows and sheep. So um, now we know what happened to the tidal marsh around the bay, right? Um, we know why they've been destroyed and how they disappeared. But you might be asking, why are tidal wetlands, tidal marshes so important? I'm gonna show you this video. So I'll, I'll um, show you this video. And then after that, I wanna stop sharing my screen and talk to all of you. So um, in order to make that discussion go a little bit better, I have three questions 
that I want you to think about while we watch this video together. So I'm gonna give you 20 seconds or so to get a pen and paper or um, write this down on your computer. Um, and maybe I will write them down in the chat box too. Um, so the first question is, what effect is the cause of global climate change? Oh, I just accidentally sent that to someone else. So first question again, what is the, what is the effect that is the cause of global climate change? Um, the second question, what are the two reasons the sea is rising? Um, again, what are the two reasons the sea is rising? That's the second question. The third question I want you to think about while we watch this video together is how does tidal marsh protect us from sea level rise and flooding? All right, once again, how does tidal marsh protect us from sea level rise and flooding? Wetlands are very valuable ecosystems that provide services to both humans and wildlife. Wetlands provide habitat for hundreds of different species of birds, dozens of different species of mammals, as well as hundreds, uh, maybe thousands of different species of invertebrates like crabs, isopods. Wetlands are also important filters of pollution and trash. The marsh vegetation acts as a screen that picks up trash before it can get out into the ocean where it becomes much more difficult to pick up and clean. Wetlands also provide another important valuable ecosystem service, fighting against climate change and sea level rise. Sea level rise is an effect of climate change, but how does climate change bring about sea level rise? Well, the first and foremost is burning of fossil fuels, and that can include running our cars, beef production, or production of plastics, any of the ways that we use petroleum and petroleum products for the things that we use in our everyday lives. In burning those fossil fuels, that creates greenhouse gases being released into our atmosphere. Examples of this are carbon dioxide and methane. Those greenhouse gases have an effect on the planet because they heat the earth. Earth's atmosphere helps to protect our planet and keep it the perfect temperature. But greenhouse gases, when we release them into the atmosphere, affect that balance and prevent the atmosphere from working as exactly as it should. So we'll absorb a lot more heat from the sun and because we have these greenhouse gases at higher concentrations in our atmosphere, it prevents that heat from being let out. So we continually have a warmer and warmer climate similar to a greenhouse. And that's where you get the greenhouse gas effect name. So on our warming planet, due to those greenhouse gases, it has an effect on our sea level. And this is why we see sea level rise. The sea level is rising for two specific reasons. The first is that ice around the globe is melting. Um, ice that is on our land and ice that is also covering part of our oceans. And then we also see thermal expansion. And what thermal expansion is, is uh, molecules are really close together and when the warmer they get, the more they spread out. And in this case, the seawater, the warmer it gets, the more it spreads and takes up more space, causing sea level rise on our coasts. Even though sea level rise is projected to increase over the next 100 years, this is something that we are already dealing with. Many coastal and island communities feel the effects of sea level rise today. So, what will sea level rise look like in the Bay Area? Depends where you are. According to the National Ocean Council and the U.S. Global Change Research Program, by the end of the century, we could see three different scenarios of sea level rise. The first scenario, in the best case scenario, this is the lowest projection, is 0.3 meters, and that's about 12 inches. The middle scenario is one meter, and that's about 40 inches. The worst case scenario and the highest 
sea level rise scenario that we could see is two meters, and that's 78 inches. Here's what those scenarios would look like in different parts of the bay. Here's where the water is now. This is where the water would be in the first scenario with 12 inches of sea level rise. Here's where the water would be in the second scenario. In the worst case scenario, the water would cover the footpath. Sea level rise will look a lot different in other places around the bay, specifically places that have been developed for businesses or homes or infrastructure like bridges and roads. Marshes provide a lot of benefits to humans. Specifically, uh, they protect us from flooding. Marshes can soak up a ton of water and store that water so that it doesn't flood our communities that are right along the shoreline. Wetlands act as a buffer protecting our seaside and bayside communities from things like sea level rise and flooding. Wetlands act as a buffer through their spongy, muddy soil. This muddy soil, like the soil you see behind me, is really good at absorbing lots of water. Uh, wetland soils can actually hold between four to 10 times their weight in water, making them really good at protecting our shoreline communities from flooding and sea level rise. Climate change and sea level rise will continue to be threats to our Bay Area communities. One of the most important things that we can do to combat this threat is restore as much area back to tidal marsh around San Francisco Bay as possible. Some historic marshes around the Bay Area are no longer able to be restored back to how they were 200 years ago, before colonization and before the huge influx of the population here in the Bay Area. Places like the Embarcadero or downtown San Francisco are no longer able to be restored back to their historic tidal marshes. However, there are lots of opportunities to restore areas back to tidal marsh all across the Bay Area. One of the best candidates for wetland restoration is the Cargill salt ponds. All of these areas used to be tidal marsh and they're still undeveloped, so they could very easily be restored back into tidal marsh. In review, you should be able to answer these questions. What effect is the main cause of global climate change? Explain how it works. What are the two reasons the sea level is rising? How does tidal marsh protect us from sea level rise and flooding? If you'd like to learn more about wetlands as buffers and carry out an experiment, check out our lesson titled Wetland in a Pan. If you want to explore how sea level rise will affect the shoreline closest to you, check out our Sea Level Rise lesson on the OLO page. All right. Um, first, how many of you were dancing right at the end of that video? Um, all right. I stopped sharing my screen so I could see you all. Um, and I want to go through some of the review questions that I gave you all before this video. So, um, First of all, does anyone have any questions about the video in general? You could type them in the chat or raise your hand and I will unmute you. I don't see any hands raised. All right, cool. Um, let's move on to the review questions. You can raise your hand if you have any thoughts about these questions or type in the chat box if you think you know the answer. But the first question was, what is the effect that is causing the global climate change? What is causing climate change? Who knows what this effect is called? You can type it in the box. You can raise your hand and tell me at the beginning of the video, what is the effect that is causing global climate change? Not seeing any hands raised. Um, oh, I see someone typed uh, greenhouse gas effect. That is correct. Well done, Andrew. Pat yourself on the back. Um, yeah, so the greenhouse gas effect is what is causing the whole world to get warmer and warmer. It's causing global warming. 
Can anyone tell me how it works? What is going on with the greenhouse gas effect? How is it warming the planet? Type it in the chat box, raise your hand. I'd love to hear other people's voices besides my own, but I totally understand if you're not comfortable talking in front of everyone. How does the greenhouse gas effect work? I got another answer, good job. The greenhouse gas effect is what's warming the planet. So basically, oh, here we go. Gas being trapped in the atmosphere, awesome. Thank you, Luke, for the participation. I appreciate it. Um, and Luke is correct. So the earth is constantly being bombarded by energy from the sun. The sun is shooting us with heat and light and um, UV radiation, ultraviolet, right? That's what gives us sunburns. And the earth is absorbing that energy. The earth also tries to release some energy in the form of heat. Um, but like Luke mentioned, the gases, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, when the earth tries to release the heat back into space, some of the heat gets trapped. It gets bounced back towards the planet. So we get a warm, we, the planet gets warmer and warmer as time goes on. Um, the second question was, what are the two reasons that sea level is rising? Who remembers from the video? There's two specific reasons why the sea is getting higher. The sea level is rising. Let me know in the chat box or um, you can raise your hand and I will let you talk. Anybody? You could always watch the video again uh, after our time together. Ice caps melting. Thank you, Luke. Um, appreciate the, the participation. And that is, again, correct. So lack of wetlands is also um, an issue here as well. So two reasons. One is ice melting, right? And specifically, it's land ice. So if I have my jar of water here and the water level is here, if I add ice into it, the water level goes up. But if that ice melts, the water, the level stays the same. It doesn't go up because the ice is already taking up space. So specifically what's making the sea level rise is ice caps um, at the poles that are on land and also glaciers. I'm sure many of you have seen glaciers getting smaller and smaller every year. Give me a thumbs up if you know that glaciers are getting smaller. So um, the other reason that you might remember from the video is thermal expansion. Thanks for the thumbs up, Andrew. Um, thanks for the thumbs up, CZ. Um, and so what thermal expansion is, is basically when things get warmer, they expand. So everything's made of molecules, right? Really, really tiny pieces that make up bigger things. And when those molecules get warmer, they start to move around and they start to spread out. And so that's what's happening to the ocean. It's getting warmer and it's taking up more space and the sea level is rising. The last question, which brings me back to um, CZ mentioned lack of wetlands as an issue. So what, how do tidal marshes protect us from sea level rise and flooding? Why do we need tidal marshes? What do they do um, to protect us? They're our first line of defense. Who remembers? Oh, I see a hand raise. Go ahead, Luke. Um, they mostly protect us by absorbing the water that otherwise would be flooding into like cities or something like that. Exactly right. Thank you. I appreciate the participation. Um, yeah, so like Luke said, the soil specifically in wetlands is really good at absorbing water. So um, it acts as a buffer, as a block between our shoreline communities and the bay or the ocean. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing. Oh, I heard someone else. Someone wanna add something? I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, and at this time, I want to... Is this almost over? We got a little more time left. Can you all mute yourself, please? So I also, I wanna just go through real fast all of the different services that 
marshes provide humans and wildlife. These are called ecosystem services. This is what marshes do for us. One is they provide habitat for hundreds of types of birds, um, dozens of types of mammals, and hundreds and thousands of types of invertebrates. By the way, this little guy is the salt marsh harvest mouse. If you put up your thumb, the salt marsh harvest mouse is the size of your thumb from nose to tail. They're very, very tiny, and they are an endangered species that only lives in the Bay Area, and they only live in tidal marsh. So another reason to keep them around, to keep tidal marshes around and bring them back. Marshes also filter pollution. They filter physical garbage and um, toxic chemicals. So you can see at the bottom of, this, of the screen, the trash that comes up with the tide, it gets caught in the plants that grow in the marsh. And so this allows us to come and pick it up so that it doesn't go back into the bay or into the ocean and become harmful to animals. So Save the Bay actually has programs that you can sign up for where we do shoreline cleanups. We go out with buckets and gloves and we pick up this garbage to make sure that it doesn't go back into the bay or the ocean. There's also microbial species, micro, microscopic life that lives in marsh soil that can break down harmful chemicals and some that are being studied that can also break down plastic. Marshes are also nurseries for lots of types of fish. So fish come to the marsh because it's nice and calm and they lay their eggs there. And this is super important for making sure that the fish populations stay healthy, which is also important for our economy, right? Because there's a lot of money involved with the fisheries. Also, marshes are just beautiful. Look at this picture. Um, marshes are an open space that people can go to, they can walk around, they can ride their bikes, um, and marshes, I think arguably the most important service that marshes provide is protection from sea level rise and flooding as a result of climate change. Now, the one other service, we talk, I talked a lot about wetlands as being important in meeting the challenge of climate change. Um, so not only do they protect us from flooding and sea level rise as a result of climate change, they also do something really important, um, which is called carbon sequestration. Um, and this is a fancy scientific term for carbon capture. So we know that when a plant lives its life, it performs a process called photosynthesis. And so plants use sunlight and carbon dioxide and perform photosynthesis to make sugar, food for themselves. And so plants are taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into their cells, into their leaves, into their roots, into their shoots. Um, and that's really good for the greenhouse gas effect. Um, this is taking carbon dioxide, which is the greenhouse gas, out of the atmosphere. The really cool thing about wetlands and so unique is wetlands are, they take up carbon um, in greater amounts and they Nani, really? take um, carbon and put it into the soil at a greater rate than forests. So trees are great. Um, they perform photosynthesis. They live really long lives and they get really big so they can store a lot of carbon. Um, however, when trees die, they decompose and the carbon that is stored in their leaves and branches, it goes back into the system um, and back into the atmosphere. The cool thing about marshes is the plants that live in the marsh live their lives, they perform photosynthesis, they take carbon out of the atmosphere, they put it in their leaves, and into the plants, and when they die, they are covered by more soil and water. So the carbon that is trapped in the plant then becomes trapped in the soil. That keeps the carbon out of the atmosphere for longer periods of time. This is why wetlands and marshes in the Bay Area are so important for fighting climate change. This is why wetlands are so unique and this is why we should care about them a lot. And it's why it's my favorite biome. Um, so you may be asking, so now we know 
um, what has happened to the tidal marshes in the Bay Area, and we know um, why tidal wetlands are so important. But the last question we need to answer together is, what are we doing about it? Right? We know we need tidal marshes back. What is Save the Bay, my organization, doing to restore tidal marsh, and how is it doing that? Um, the short answer is we take plants from one spot, native plants, and we put them in another spot. Um, but obviously, it's not this um, simple. It's pretty complex. And to answer this question, I want to show you another video. So um, after this video, I want to have another discussion. Yes, that was Patrick Starr. Um, I want to have another discussion about what we learned in this video. And so with that, I have three more review questions for us to talk about and for you to think about while we watch this video. So get your pens and pencils and paper ready, or if you're typing this on your computer, um, the three questions are, what part of the marsh does Save the Bay focus our restoration work and why? So again, the first part of the question, in what part of the marsh do we focus our restoration work and why do we focus there? Second question, what is Save the Bay's seasonal restoration cycle? Um, again, what is Save the Bay's seasonal restoration cycle? Seasonal is a hint for you. Basically, how do we go from bare ground um, and no plants to beautiful marsh? The last question that I want you to think about while we watch this video together is what is the purpose of monitoring? And what two things are we looking for while we monitor? Again, the last question I want you to think about, what is the purpose of monitoring and what two things are we looking for? So I'll show the video and then I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can all talk to each other. Oh, last thing for this video, um, you'll want to turn up your volume a little bit because for some reason this one is a little quieter than the last video. Starting now. Look at the habitat around you. Notice differences between this side and this side. This area here is the tidal marsh and specifically the inner tidal zone. And in this area, it looks so different because this is where the tides inundate and then uncover uh, parts of the marshes. So it's predominantly pickleweed, but when you look at this side here, this is what we call the transition zone. And this is where Save the Bay focuses our restoration work. So during a high tide, the water will come up to this point and all of the animals, including the salt marsh harvest mouse that live down in the low zone, will then be able to come up to the transition zone and find refuge in California native plants and also find food and other resources and be protected during those high tides. It's important for us to plant native plants in the transition zone because we can provide resources that our native animals are familiar with and know how to use in order to survive in the environment. To restore transition zone habitat, we first look to existing examples of healthy T-zones nearby and gather expert knowledge to determine which plant species to use. With permission from landowners, we collect native seeds in the summer and fall. In the early spring, seeds are sown at our nurseries. The seedlings are transplanted into pots where they will grow until they are strong enough to be outplanted in the coming wet winter months. To support our young native plants, we occasionally hand water them actively remove invasives, and create a protective mulch barrier around them. Modeling our restoration strategy around the natural processes of these native habitats gives them the best chance for success well into the future. In order to know where to focus our work, we systematically observe our site looking for a variety of species and habitat structure. This process is called monitoring, and here's what monitoring looks like. Our monitoring day begins with Denise and Rachel stretching out a 100 meter tape along the back shore. The back shore is what separates the intertidal zone and the transition zone. The next step is to measure and calculate the average elevation of the back shore. The 
the point where the inner tidal zone ends and the transition zone begins. Here's Rebs with the stadia rod, basically a ruler that helps Kenneth measure the elevation with the clinometer. You can see Kenneth way down the road. We use the average elevation to standardize the backshore, clearly defining where the transition zone begins. By moving the meter tape up or down to match the average elevation, we are making sure that the back shore is consistent throughout the monitoring site. Uh, lower. Lower. This is important because our restoration site is split into four zones. The intertidal zone, oh. the low zone, the mid zone, and the high zone and each zone is home to different plants. Standardizing the back shore not only tells us where the transition zone begins, it also tells us where each of these zones begin, which is vital in the next step where we go into each zone and check and see how our plants are doing. Here's Denise laying down a quadrat in the low zone, a one meter by one meter tool we use to monitor. The quadrats are laid at randomly selected points along the meter tape. In the quadrats, we measure each plant. We measure the height, and we measure the amount of space that plant species takes up in the square. We also record what percentage of the square is taken up by non-living material and bare ground. Now it's your turn to try. Looking at this quadrat, what percentage of the entire square would you say is taken up by plants? What percentage would you say is taken up by soil or dead plant matter? In summary, we monitor our restoration sites to look at two different things. First, the percentage of non-native and native cover, and second, the height of the vegetation, which can inform us about the structure of the habitat in that area. We monitor over the course of many years because it does take time for us to reach our restoration goals. And by using the data, we can make informed decisions about where to target specific practices. For example, if you have the mid zone with high non-native cover, then we can choose to weed in that particular area and start to plant more native species there improving the conditions of that habitat and reaching, helping us to reach the goals of our restoration. Save the Bay operates four nursery facilities to support our habitat restoration work. We propagate and outplant approximately 35 to 40,000 plants each year. For most of this work, we rely on volunteers. If you'd like to help out, visit our website at savesfbay.org. All right, so in the interest of time, I want to skip uh, a conversation because I really wanna to get to this activity with you all. So this is a monitoring challenge and I got some responses for that picture, that image that you saw. This square we call a quadrat and we use these to see um, how our sites are doing. So. The question was how much uh, percentage wise, what percent of this square is taken up by living plants and what percent is taken up by dead plants or bare ground? I got some guesses, 70, 60, 40 to 50%. This is actually 30% live plants and 70% dead plants or bare ground. So this one's a little difficult, um, but for the rest of the activity, um, it's gonna be a little easier. So um, give me, type yes in the chat box if you can see this picture of these beautiful flowers. Before we get started, I wanna make sure people can see. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, Luke, appreciate it. Um, okay, so the challenge is, what percentage of this square is taken up by the white yellow flowers? And it's gonna be different for everyone. So. Right now, you can type what you think, what percentage of the square is taken up by the white yellow flower? How much? 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40
first guess, 40 to 30. I like the use of <laughs> the dashes. Um, cool, so we're getting some guesses. Um, what's, what, this is how it's gonna look. We're gonna have a red filter and then it's gonna be negative and this is your last chance to type it in um, because after this, you get the percentage. All right, and we'll round this to the nearest place of five. So I would round this to 30. Everybody good? All right, I wanna get through this so I can answer some questions if you all have questions. We have 10 more minutes together. Okay, next. Um, what percent of this square is taken up by yellow flowers? Yellow flowers. Got 50, okay, that's good, that's a good guess. 56, someone getting more specific, well done. 20, 40, let's see, red, the negative image. 61% snaps for a couple of you. Good job getting real close. Okay, next one. Oh, here's an interesting one. What percent of this square is taken up by the white pink flowers? I see 10%, 5%, 2%, nice and small. It's not that much space, right? Red filter, 8%, negative image. This is your last chance to guess. I see another 8%, a couple eights, 1%. I think someone said two, good job. Um, all right, next. How about this grass? How much of this square is taken up by grass? Eighty percent first guess. Seventy, eighty, seventy-five, eighty. Getting a lot of high numbers. Love the participation. Red screen, a hundred percent negative image. Last chance to guess, 70 to 60. I love the range, it's such a good strategy. 71%, I would round down to 70 for this one probably. Good job, here's a weird one. What percent of this picture is covered by this strange red plant? Twenty-three, fifty, so about half of the picture. Twenty-one, almost a quarter, ten percent or five percent. Weird plant. I know it's strange, isn't it? I see twenty-five. Let's see, red hue, negative image. Last chance to guess. Ten percent. I would round this one up. Here is a basil rosette. This is basically a ring of leaves around a big stem, like uh, mustard or radish. So how much of this square is taken up by this basil rosette? 28, quick, yeah, quick guess, good job. Basil. 34, 40 to 30, 20%, 60%. We're all over the place with this one. Got 45, 90%. Okay, we're going red. Then a negative image. Last chance to guess. Oh my Lord, what is that? Um, 10 million percent, that's too much. 31% for this one. Okay, this is the last one. And then I wanna take questions if you all have them. What percent of this square is taken up by the blue flowers? Zero percent, one hundred twenty-three percent. Oh man, I'm not even going to be able to read that number in time. All right, let's see. Red, negative image. Last chance to guess. Forty-five percent. I would round up for this one. 
All right. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. I want to take questions from you all if you have them. But real quick, someone asked where we could find the videos, the links for those videos. And so if you go to our website, savesfbay.org, um, you can find our education portal, which is called Outdoor Learning Online. The videos that we saw today will be there. And if you type in savesfbay.org backslash Olo, um, you could see those videos and other videos and some activities that you could do that go along with those videos. We also do field trips. If you had fun today, you could tell your teacher to sign up for a field trip. Um, go to our website, savesfbay.org um, and find get involved on the tab and then go to student programs. We also do public programs um, once once the pandemic is over, then we can join each other again on the shoreline. Um, you can find out what events are coming up on our calendar, which you can find at savesfa.org. And then the top right, you can find a button that says volunteer, and that takes you directly to our calendar. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You can see also my contact information. If you have any questions or if you want to tell your teacher to email me or your parents or whatever, um, I'm stopping my screen sharing right now so I can take questions from you all. Um, you could type your questions, video on the above website. Yeah, so if you go, someone asked about videos, um, go to savesfa.org backslash Olo. If you put that in your search bar, you could find our videos. Um, any other questions? Questions, comments, concerns. Oh, uh, who stopped that? What's up, Kalano? Who stopped the video share? I mean, who stopped the um, share screen? I stopped sharing my screen. Don't worry, Kalano. I got all his info, and we'll contact him and, and we'll follow up. All right. Thank you so much, Rosa Parks. Uh, appreciate the presentation quite a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you, Mr. You, Charlie. You're welcome, Thank you, Gianni. Thank you, Mr. Charlie. You're all welcome. Thank, Thank you. you.